This Parsha podcast is dedicated in loving memory and for the merit of the elevation of the soul of Asher ben Yosef. May his soul be elevated in heaven. If you would like to dedicate an upcoming episode of the Parsha podcast or any other one of the suite of podcasts coming from the Torch Center in Houston, Texas, or if you'd like to give me a message or ask a question or give some feedback, we always appreciate that. Email me, rabbiwalby at gmail.com. Parsha Shlach, of course, tells the story of the spies. The nation is under the impression that they're about to enter the land. You know, they spent a whole year at Sinai, and they got the Torah, and they have the tabernacle, and they're on the move. And they send 12 men, one from every tribe, to go on a recon mission, to go scout out the land and report back on what they find. Among these 12 men are Joshua and Caleb. And the Torah tells us that Moshe renames Joshua. Initially, he was called Hoshea. And Moshe added the Yud from Hoshea to Yehoshua to Joshua. Even though Joshua was already called Joshua prior in the Torah, most opinions argue that actually he was always Hoshea, and now he's named Joshua. But the Torah calls him Joshua even earlier based upon the future events. And this, our sages tell us, this is a form of prayer. Moshe realizes that this mission is pregnant with danger. And the name Yehoshua, that is a sort of prayer that Joshua be spared of the evil plot of the other spies. Now the spies reconnoiter the land. They crisscross the land for 40 days. The Torah details their itinerary. There is one noteworthy detour. Caleb stops in Hebron by himself to pray for success in avoiding joining the scheme of the spies. He prostrates himself, Rashi tells us, on the graves of the forefathers who are interred in the cave of the patriarchs. And that's a form of prayer to be spared from the evil plot of the other spies. And after the spies return, they deliver their report to Moshe and to the people. And the report was devastating. Even though they acknowledge that the land is indeed flowing with milk and honey, they report that the people who live there are fearsome and the cities are impregnable and to conquer it's just not feasible. Now two of the spies, Joshua and Caleb, they argue, well, God's on our side. And if so, we can carve the Canaanites up like bread. But the nation buys into the narrative of the other ten spies, and they sob for the whole night. And this is a grave sin on the same level, maybe even worse than the sin of the golden calf. And God gets very angry with the nation. And he threatens, as happened with the golden calf, to destroy the whole nation and start from scratch with Moshe. Moshe launches into prayer, and he succeeds in getting the Almighty to not unleash that upon the nation. But nevertheless, in punishment for the spies' 40-day journey throughout the land, the nation is condemned to stay in the wilderness for 40 years. With the exception of Joshua and Caleb, the entire adult population will die in the wilderness and only their descendants will enter the land. This story is the, obviously the largest part of the Parsha. And it's a great mystery. You know, we're dealing with giants. Rashi tells us that these people are called men, anashim, which is a term of greatness. These are leaders of the nation. The Ramban actually says that when they are delineated in the Torah, they are organized by greatness. So Caleb is number three, and Joshua is number five. Of these 12 men, there were four spies who were greater than Joshua. We're not dealing with lightweights here. These are the heavyweights of the heavyweights. And they give this report that completely deflates the nation. They show the nation these gargantuan fruits, and they talk about how mighty and strong the people and the defenses of these people, these Canaanites are. And they invoke Amalek. Of course, Amalek is terrifying to these people who had to wage war against them. 
and they talk about all the people and where they're situated and how devastatingly strong they are. And then Caleb interjects and he uses a clever tactic, Rashi tells us, to get everyone's attention. And he gives off the impression that he's actually one of the other spies. And he says, well, is this all that Moshe did for us? And everyone or the spies are under the impression that he's going to layer it on. And therefore, they gave him the floor. They gave him the microphone. And he said, well, Moshe split the sea for us. Moshe gave us the manna. And Moshe gave us the quail. And if we follow the Almighty, we will ascend. Rashi tells us that means that even if we have to climb all the way to heaven, we'll make ladders and, and ascend there. We'll, we'll succeed in whatever task the Almighty gives us. But the other ten spies, they respond, no, we, we can't do it. The nation's too strong. And they spoke evilly about the land. And they said the land is a land that eats its inhabitants. All the people that we see there are so mighty and fearsome. We cannot succeed in our mission. Now the Talmud tells us that the night when the spies gave their slanderous report, that was none other than the ninth day of the month of Av. So it's about a year and a half after the Exodus. And this was the first ninth of Av. And of course, that is the saddest day in the Jewish calendar. On that same day, the first temple was destroyed. The second temple was destroyed. The city of Betar was destroyed. And where is the roots of all that destruction? Where was the first Tisha B'Av? It's this night. They're crying. They're crying the whole night. They're sobbing needlessly the whole night. And God says, the Talmud tells us, God says, okay, you want to cry tonight? And you're crying for nothing? I want to give the land. I want to hand it to you on a silver platter. And you're crying? And you're terrified? You have no, you're not displaying faith in God? I will give you ample reason to cry on this night. And they complain about Moshe, about Aaron. If only we died in the land of Egypt, or maybe we should have died in the wilderness. Why does God want to bring us to the land? We're just going to be slaughtered. Our wives, our children. It's better for us to return to Egypt. And it's just spiraling out of control here. And Joshua and Caleb try to restore equilibrium here. And they they tear their garments. And they try to reassure the nation, no, no, the the land that the Almighty is going to bring us to, the land that we crossed to inspect is very good. And if God is desirous of us, he'll bring us there. And he'll give us this land that is flowing with milk and honey. Don't rebel against God. The enemies of our people are just outwardly fearsome, but they're a paper tiger. We're not worried about them. We can eat them like bread. And the nation is not assuaged. And they want, or they threaten to stone them. And the honor of God appears in the tabernacle. So this is the story of the report. These 10 spies, they give a very damning report about the land. And Joshua and Caleb valiantly but fruitlessly try to comfort the nation and reassure them that it doesn't work and it's a total disaster. Now, the consequences are very harsh. Initially, God wanted to just, that's it, destroy everyone. This is beyond the pale. And Moshe prays and the nation is spared. But this sin condemns the nation to endure 40 years in the wilderness. Moreover, every adult who was present, every adult that left Egypt, is going to die. Only Joshua and Caleb are going to overlap with the generation that will ultimately enter the land. Everyone else died. And on this night, the night that there was needless bewailing, this is a night that is forever, or at least until Messiah comes, it's designated for crying for a very good reason. You cried for a very bad reason, now God will give you a very good reason to cry. So, in effect, this story is telling us about the destruction. Temple 1, Temple 2, these are all spiritual byproducts 
of what happened right over here. There's something about the episode of the spies that caused the destruction of the temples and the exiling of the nation. So this is a total disaster. And all of it stems from the slanderous report of the spies. And again, these were not lightweights. These were titans of men, giants among the people, yet they blundered so spectacularly. So how do we understand what happened over here? So if you examine the story, it starts off with Moshe. And some of the blame perhaps can be pinned on Moshe. God tells Moshe and the people, it's a very good land. And he has our back. Yet Moshe signs off on this decision to send these spies to go inspect it. And it seems like he knew it was doomed. After all, he renames Joshua as a form of prayer that Joshua be spared from the plot of the, of the spies. So both Rashi and Ramban, at the beginning of the Parsha, they question the wisdom and really the rationale of Moshe to make this seemingly inexplicable decision to send this mission in the first place. So Rashi, in fact, tells us that the people asked Moshe to send spies, and Moshe asked God, and God says, well, I, I told you, I'm going to bring you to a better place. I'll take care of you. And now you want to rely on yourselves and not rely on me? Okay. What happens when you rely on fallible humans? You have room for error. So the beginning of the blunder, our sages tell us, was the decision to send the spies in the first place. Even though it's certainly prudent to scout out the enemy and find out where their defenses are, if you're going to launch a war of conquest, they shouldn't have done it. They should have relied on God. Now, the Ramban has an essay where he tries to understand all the elements of a decision. What was the people's rationale? They wanted to do it and to avoid miracles. We don't rely on miracles. But God really told them that, well, this is going to be miraculous. And maybe this is the exception. Ordinarily, you don't rely on miracles. But this is the exception because God explicitly said that this conquest will not operate under the normal rules. It will be miraculous. But I want to focus today on the spies. We have 10 verses 2. 10 giants, leaders amongst the people. And they make a terrible mistake and they, in fact, die in our Parsha. And then we have these two heroes, Joshua and Caleb. And they are handsomely rewarded for their bravery. And there's a conflict here. And I want to understand the calculus of the ten spies. How did such a calamity unfold? And also to understand the flip side, what led Joshua and Caleb to avoid the mistake of the other ten? So, of course, this question has been legislated and discussed before. What exactly is the perspective of, of these spies? These were leaders of the people. They should have known better. So there's a famous idea, and we've shared some of these ideas in the past. The Zohar says that these leaders had a bias against entering the land. They were leaders, after all. And they were concerned that the conquest of the land will result in new elections being called, meaning their standing as leaders may be disrupted by the new reality in the land. And therefore, they had a they had a bias against entering the land, and therefore, even though there was really nothing wrong with the land, they were able to find it. It's almost like the opposite of the famous quote. It's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on him not understanding it. If someone feels like the only way that they can endure and they can maintain their standing is by finding some flaw, they'll do it. These were great people, but even a great person who is biased, they may use all their guile and machinations to effectuate the result that they are biased towards. And they may not even be aware of the underlying bias. So that's one idea that has been discussed. 
that these people, they wanted to remain leaders. And in the wilderness, they were leaders. And in the land, well, that was in question. And therefore, to maintain their hold on power, they were willing to do whatever it takes to get the nation to remain in the wilderness and not to enter the land. That's one idea. Another rationale argues that the motivation of the spies was to prevent the nation from entering. Why? So that they can remain in the lofty, spiritual world of the wilderness. In the wilderness, the nation was living in a spiritual utopia. They're enveloped by these godly clouds, and they're eating the manna, and they have the water coming out of the rock, and they're studying under the tutelage of Moshe. All their physical, material needs are met, and they could just focus, immerse themselves completely in the wisdom of the Almighty. They can study Torah uninterrupted, unbothered by any distractions. It's paradise. What happens when you enter the land? We've got to portion the land. Everyone's got to work their field. That's a much lower spiritual standing. And therefore, they found the flaws, whatever it takes, to get the nation to remain in the wilderness. That was their perspective. That is why they found flaws in the land. But of course, this is a mistake because that's not your job. That's not your call to make. If you're hired to do a job, do your job and don't worry about the second, third order effects of your job. So those are some of the ideas that have been suggested to understand the rationale of the spies. But the most basic idea, this is essentially what the Ramban says, is that they were simply doing their job. They described the situation as they saw it. Go look at the land. Go inspect the cities. Well, they found the cities are great, impregnable, fortified cities. Oh, and the people, they're massive. They're terrifying. They're ferocious. We have the menacing nation of Amalek in the south. And they assessed the situation, and they determined that we're not equipped, we're ill-equipped for the task of conquering the land. Evaluate the sides. You have 31 kings and seven nations and great fortified cities. And of course, a defensive army always has an advantage over an attacking army. And they have these incredible defenses. Just evaluate the situation. We can't win. And that's, of course, examining it from the physical perspective of the war calculus. This is also true on a spiritual sense. The land of Israel, it's not just any ordinary land. It has to be conquered spiritually as well. Maybe even primarily. The Talmud talks about how the land of Israel is acquired with suffering. There is a degree of of spiritual acquisition that's needed that has to entail some suffering to acquire the land of Israel. And part of what the spies were saying is that the spiritual demands that are needed to acquire the land are just too much. The Hasidic masters tell us when they said the land kills, eats those who dwell upon it, its inhabitants, the Hebrew word for that is Yoshveha, which means those who sit in it. So the great Hasidic masters say, there's something about the land that's very demanding. Anyone who sits, anyone who is stagnant, is going to be gobbled up by the land. The rest of the lands, the land is not uh, bothered so much by your spiritual standing. But in Israel, in the land of the Almighty, The land itself will demand that you undertake an odyssey of relentless spiritual ascent. It's a land that eats those who sit, who are stagnant. And they evaluated the people. 
year and a half or so after the Exodus, they're just not up both to the spiritual and the physical demands of conquest of the land. So the spies, you can argue, they were hired to do a job. Go evaluate the land and evaluate what we would need to do to conquer it. And they scouted the land and they spent 40 days in the land and they measured it up on the physical level and the spiritual level. And they determined it's just not possible. And they simply conveyed that to the nation. And this, of course, raises another question. Okay, so why were they punished? They did their job. You might disagree with their findings. You might disagree with their conclusions. But you gave them a job. Go inspect the land. They did the job and they shared their findings with you. So perhaps the idea is that their misdeed was not their diagnosis. Instead, it was their prescription. They were told to examine the land, share your findings, not to suggest what to do. And they say, well, we have no chance. We cannot conquer it. That was not part of the scope of their mission. If you look at the verses of instruction of Moshe, their mandate was simply to evaluate the land. And even the questions about the people were only as a proxy for evaluating the land. And then when they overstep their mandate and they begin to opine on the conquerability of the land, that's their crime and that's how they can be punished. But the larger point is that the spies argued that it is infeasible for the nation to succeed in conquering the land. And therefore, they should find alternatives, go back to Egypt, remain in the wilderness, whatever it is. Entering the land will result in you getting completely slaughtered. The land is unconquerable. That was the position of ten of the spies. Now, Joshua and Caleb disagreed. Now, what's interesting about this, at what point in the narrative of the other ten spies do Joshua and Caleb disagree with? You'll notice that they never contest the veracity of the other ten's assessment. In fact, they acknowledge that the land is unconquerable. But they argue that we'll do it nonetheless. Caleb, what does he say? He quiets down the people. He uses his clever tactic. Everyone's quiet. And he says, Alone Allah, we will ascend. Rashi says, We will ascend even if it means climbing to heaven and making ladders to ascend to heaven. What does that mean? What is the hyperbole here? Caleb is conceding to the central diagnosis of the other spies. There is no natural way to conquer the land. It's like making ladders to climb to heaven. But so what? If God tells us to do it, we'll do it. Continue Joshua and Caleb. If the Almighty is on our side, we'll carve them up like bread. The defense that our enemies will mount will be akin to the defense that bread gives to the knife. So the dispute between Joshua and Caleb and the other ten spies is not about the diagnosis. The facts on the ground were unanimously accepted. The task before the nation was impossible. The task indeed was undoable. Under the rules of the world, under the constraints of physics, it was impossible. There's no way in the world for them to do it. More precisely said, there was no way in this world, with the rules and limitations of this world, for them to do it. But Joshua and Caleb, they added another wrinkle. Who says that this nation has to operate by the limitations, by the strictures of this world. Who says that we need to be governed by the rules of this world? Maybe we can operate under supernatural rules. 
And that's the argument of Joshua and Caleb. Let's enter the land and we will conquer it. Like what happened in Jacob's dreams? We can ascend to heaven on ladders like angels. We don't operate by the same rules as ordinary humans. Yes, you examined the fortifications. You saw the people. You measured them and they were so imposing. But so what? Don't bring those rules to our nation. We can carve up these imposing foes, these giants, these Amalekites. We'll carve them up like bread. With God on our side, we're operating on a supernatural level. And the resistance that they will present will match the resistance that a sandwich presents before it is gobbled up. Under the rules, under the limitations of this world, the land indeed is unconquerable and the nation is inadequate. The nation's just not up to the task. Under the limitations of this world, the ten spies were right. They're like a bunch of grasshoppers facing off against giants. But what if we're governed by a completely different set of rules? Then nothing will stop us. Yes, say Joshua and Caleb, it is impossible. We'll do it nonetheless. Yes, they are unconquerable. We'll conquer them nonetheless. That is the essence of the disagreement between Joshua and Caleb and the other ten spies. And I think this is a valuable thing to examine because if we are ever faced with a challenge that seems totally undoable, unconquerable, it's impossible. We see the story of Joshua and Caleb. They serve as the paradigmatic examples of how to do the impossible. And therefore, I think it's worthwhile to study very closely what they did. Now, just to get started, there are some interesting variables in the lives of both Caleb and Joshua that make their situation a bit different than that of the other spies. For one, Caleb had a son. His name was Hur. We've talked about him in the past. And Hur was murdered by a riotous mob during the story of the golden calf. Moshe leaves. He appoints Aaron and Hur to watch over the nation. This is in chapter 24 of Exodus. And Rashi tells us, the Talmud tells us, that when the nation began to try to make a golden calf, Hur stood up. I tried to stop them. And they killed him. And that's why Aaron wanted to play ball. We talked about this. He was a, a, a prophet, was also a priest. And that's why he thought it would be more dangerous for the nation if they killed him than if they made the golden calf. We talked about this, Parshas Ki Sisa, a few months ago. Caleb is Hur's father. And we see Hur, the son, going up against the mob. And he was actually killed by the mob. And we see the mob here threatening to kill Joshua and Caleb. 14.10, the nation tried to, or was going to, was threatening to stone them with stones. And we see the same indomitable spirit that Hur had. We see it in Caleb. An interesting variable. Another variable is that Caleb's wife is part of the story. Caleb's wife and Hur's mother is none other than Miriam, Moshe's older sister. So Caleb is Moshe's brother-in-law, Moshe and Aaron's brother-in-law, the father of Hur. Now the first Rashi in our Parsha tells us that the reason why our Parsha, Parshas Shlach, is just the post of the events of the end of last week's parsha is because at the end of last week's parsha, Miriam got saras for slandering Moshe, and these wicked ones, i.e., the ten other spies, they saw what happened to her, 
and they failed to take the lesson. So let's just think, we know that Caleb is Miriam's husband. And she is germane to our episode. And Caleb, you would imagine, was at ground zero, so to speak, in that story. So a few interesting variables about Caleb. Now, Joshua, also in Lassie's parasha, there were the two renegade prophets. And they were prophesying in the camp. And they declared that Moshe will die and Joshua will lead the conquest of the land. So before the events of our parsha, there were at least two prophets who were actually legitimate prophets who declared publicly that Joshua was going to lead the conquest of the land. In a certain sense, the spies did not want to conquer the land because it would spell their demotion. Joshua had the opposite incentive, you would imagine. He is slated to lead the nation into the land, as Eldad and Medad prophesied. Now, there's a few different ways to go with this. The Chassam Sofa, for example, says that initially it was Caleb and Caleb alone who fought back against the mob and said, we will ascend even if it means climbing to heaven on ladders. But Joshua was silent. Why was Joshua silent? So he says that Joshua, they can claim that he was biased because he wanted to enter the land because he knew or he would have known, given the prophecy of the two renegade prophets, that that would mean that he is accelerated to be the leader of the people. Now, the Ramban, he argues that Joshua was not slated to be the successor until this episode. In fact, he writes that Joshua's reward for standing up to the mob was that he was designated as Moshe's successor. 14.24, the verse describes the reward of Caleb. He will inherit the land, meaning he will earn the land of Hebron, in which he prayed. And the Ramban says, well, what about Joshua? Why does he not get some reward for doing the right thing? And the Ramban says that it's not appropriate to discuss Joshua's reward, because his reward is that he is going to succeed Moshe, and it's just not right to mention that right now. But I want to suggest a framework to understand Joshua and Caleb. How did they have the wherewithal, the tenacity, to stand up to the crowd. And yes, their claim is that we could conquer the land even though it's unconquerable by the rules of nature. But we'll do the impossible. How did they have the fortitude, the belief, the faith, the indomitable spirit to believe that they can do the impossible? So you'll notice both Joshua and Caleb did something different than the rest of Spies. Caleb went by himself to Hebron to pray, to prostrate himself upon the graves of the patriarchs. The verse tells us, chapter 13, verse 22, Vo ad Hebron, and he came to Hebron. The verse transitions from plural to singular. They ascended in the south, and he came to Hebron. So Rashi, as he always does, He clues us in to what happened. Caleb himself went to Hebron. So they all ascended, all 12 of them ascended from the south. But he, only Caleb, had a detour and went to Hebron. And he prostrated himself upon the graves of the great antecedents so that he does not become seduced by the spies and does not join their evil plot. And that's why His reward was he was granted the city of Hebron as an extra inheritance. Caleb connected to the spirit of the patriarchs and the matriarchs and used that as a means to succeed in this challenge. With the force of the patriarchs, we can ascend to heaven with ladders. We could do the impossible. No problem. Joshua also 
was different than the other spies in that Moshe prayed for him. And Moshe renamed him. His name was Hoshea. And Moshe renamed him Yehoshua. Now, there's an amazing Talmud. The Talmud tells us that that letter that was added to his name, it already existed for someone else. Elsewhere in the Torah, that letter Yud was removed from a person. Abraham was married to Sarah. Sarah was initially called Sarai. And just as Abraham was renamed Abraham, Sarai was renamed Sarah, Sarah. But unlike Abraham to Abraham, where there was no reduction of a letter, with Sarai to Sarah, that transition, it was the swapping of the hay for the yud. What happened with that yud? Sarai was spelled with the yud. Sarah, the yud is gone. Says the Talmud, that same yud, that is what was added to the name Hoshea to make Yehoshea, Yehoshua. How did Joshua and Caleb pull off the impossible? How did they overcome the other ten spies who were persuasive enough to get the whole nation? How did they have this belief in doing the impossible, in conquering the unconquerable? Both of them tapped into the resolve, into the resilience, into the spirit of the patriarchs and the matriarchs. Both remembered where we come from. Everyone else is limited by what is feasible, what is possible. We come from these giants who did the impossible. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and their respective spouses. They did the impossible. They forged an intimate relationship with God out of nothing, out of whole cloth. They built this nation upon firm pillars. They built an eternal nation. We're their children. We have their influence, their spirit coursing within us. We can do the same. I'm the son of Abraham. I'm the son of Sarah. And the rest of the patriarchs and matriarchs. I'm not going to be swayed by the shenanigans of this mob. Caleb goes and he prostrates himself at the burial spots of the forefathers and he absorbs their influence and he connects with them and he is steeled against the influence of the spies. Joshua is given a letter from Sarah. They're armed with the power of their great antecedents and Joshua and Caleb triumph. Joshua and Caleb realize that we can do the impossible. There's nothing that's undoable. Our enemies are like bread. Our mission is doable, even if it means climbing to heaven upon ladders. And therefore, Caleb, he truly embodies the spirit of the forefathers. And he earns the right to acquire the city of Hebron. He is worthy of presiding over the city. He is completely in sync with the forefathers. He realizes what it means to be a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Joshua, he merited to lead this nation. He is at the vanguard of the people of the nation founded by these illustrious antecedents. Joshua and Caleb embody the spirit, the strength, the resolve, the resilience, the tenacity, the strength of faith of the patriarchs and the matriarchs. We could do the impossible. We could conquer the unconquerable. Who are the scions of these great national founders? Joshua and Caleb. They channeled their spirit. And that's why they disagree with the other spies. Yes, the land is unconquerable. It's not doable. So what? We come from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We have the spirit of Sarah within us. We could do the impossible. I want to add another wrinkle to this idea. We had two renegade prophets in Lassie's Parsha. They made a proclamation in a public setting. And they said, Moshe will die 
and Joshua will lead the conquest of the land. Now, at that time, Joshua was not called Joshua. His name was Hoshea, not Yehoshua. He was only renamed Yehoshua before the episode of the spies. So at that time, he was called Hoshea. So perhaps we can suggest that until the point where Joshua was renamed Yehoshua, no one knew that the rogue prophecy of Eldad and Metad was referring to Joshua ben Nun. Maybe they thought, maybe there was another Joshua. Maybe they were talking about someone else. After all, their prophecy was, Moshe will die and Joshua will lead the conquest. And Joshua was not called Joshua at that time. It was Hosea. It's a different name. And perhaps, when Moshe renames Joshua, he is telling him, you are the Yehoshua that Eldad and Medad, the two rogue prophets, referenced. And perhaps, this is another element of how Joshua and Caleb believed in doing the impossible. Moshe is telling him, you're going to fill my shoes. You're going to be the sun to my moon. So yes, Joshua did have the letter Yud given to him from Sarah. But maybe this is another way that Joshua was able to have the resolve to do the unthinkable, to do the impossible, to do the unconquerable. Maybe there are two ways to do the impossible. One way is to realize who you are and where you came from. If you are a descendant of the spiritual giants who did the impossible, the world was barren, the world was empty, the world was spiritually desolate until Abraham came around. He turned over the whole world. If you were to look at Abraham's mission before it began, you would say, it is impossible. It's impossible. The whole nation, the whole world is obsessed with idolatry. Idolatry conquered all. They won. It's over. That's what we would say. That's how we would assess Abraham's mission. To change the whole world? To inspire the whole world? It's not possible. And Abraham, and Sarah, and Isaac, and Rebecca, and Jacob, and his wives, they did it! They pulled it off. They pulled it off. Caleb says, I'm, I'm going there. I'm going to Hebron. I'm going to go prostrate myself upon these graves. I'm a descendant of these people. It's in our DNA. We do the impossible. And yes, looking with your physical eyeballs at these fortified cities and these monstrosities of warriors, you would say it's impossible. So what? We'll do it anyhow. Caleb realized where he came from. And Joshua, to a certain extent, did as well. But Joshua was also told, you are Yehoshua. You are the person that they referenced. You are this leader. You're destined for great things. Not just where you came from, but where you're going to. By your name, it's stamped that great things, great things are going to happen. And therefore, you too can live up to the task. To be Moshe's successor, can you think of any greater shoes to fill? Can you imagine being told that? You always want to follow the the guy who flounders, the guy who blunders. To follow, to succeed someone like Moshe, it's impossible. Moshe whispers into Joshua, you're Joshua. You're the successor. It's going to happen. It's impossible. So what? It's going to happen anyhow. It's inevitable. Joshua realized the inevitability of doing the impossible 
in the future. There's no choice. It's going to happen anyhow. Do it, because it's going to happen. I think this idea or these ideas really can be very valuable for us. If we are ever in a situation, in a position where there's something before us that we feel like we need to do, it's the right thing to do, it's a task before us, and it's totally undoable. It's impossible. Remember. Remember where we came from. Remember the lesson of Caleb and Joshua. There's no limitations. There's nothing that we cannot do. Climb up to heaven in ladders like angels. Doable. Check. I will even add, every day we pray. How do we start off our prayer? We mention God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob. Why do we do that? Why is that the opening statement of our prayer? Prayer is also impossible. Who are you, you lowly earthling? You're going to come before God, king of all kings, creator of heaven and earth, creator of the entire universe and everything in it? Puny little you? You're going to stand before God? It's impossible. Yes, it's impossible. But I'm the son of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We do the impossible. The Talmud tells us, every person must say, when will my actions match the actions, the deeds, the behavior of my forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? We all have to shoot for the stars. We all have to dream big. We have to aspire for great things. Not just great things, the greatest. You have to say, you're obligated to say, when will I match Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? All of us have to realize we have this power within us. There is no such a thing as impossible. It's not in our dictionary. The Israelis have a great line, En lo yachol, yesh lo which translates, there is no such a thing as it's not possible. There is a thing. I don't want to. That, in fact, exists. I can't do it does not exist. I don't want to. Yeah, sure. <laughs> that exists. There's nothing that's impossible. And we have to realize where we came from and where we're going towards. And the mission may seem to be completely undoable. We're doing it anyhow. Now, unfortunately, Joshua and Caleb were in the minority. The masses of the people were swept away by the argument of the other spies. And this happened on Tish above. And the roots of this event were manifested in the structure of the temple, Temple 1, Temple 2. You know what else is impossible? Lowly human, fallible human, fallible human community having God in our midst. God dwelling in the midst of humans? It's impossible. And we did it. But it's impossible. And the roots of us losing that is here. When the spies say it's impossible, we can't do it. Okay. When you say you can't do something impossible, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And indeed, the temple was destroyed. But of course, the lesson of Joshua and Caleb can inspire us, can educate us, can uplift us. Remember where you came from. Remember what influence you have within you. There's nothing you cannot do. We like to end off the Parsha podcast with a question. Something to chew over. Something to mow. Something to ponder. Caleb, the hero of our Parsha, he is given a very rare Distinction. Chapter 14, verse 24. And my servant, Caleb, because he had a different spirit within him, 
he will enter the land, and he will inherit the land, him and his descendants. Caleb is called an Eved, a servant of God. How many people in the Torah are called a servant of God, are given that great distinction? We can't say that this is a trivia question because there's nothing trivial in the Torah. But if you look throughout the whole Torah, you'll find that Caleb shares this distinction with a very select group. Abraham, Genesis chapter 26, verse 24. He is described as Avraham Avdi, Abraham, my servant. Moshe, several times in the Torah. Exodus 14.31. Numbers 12.6.7. That's last year's parsha. At the end of his life, in Devarim chapter 34, Moshe again is called the servant of God. Who else? That's it. Abraham, Moshe, and Caleb. Now, if you were to say, you know, which one doesn't fit, you would say Caleb really doesn't fit. Abraham, well, he's the founder of it all. Moshe is the greatest man who ever lived. Caleb was great. But isn't it interesting that Caleb, and Caleb alone, has some overlap between him and Abraham and Moshe? You can even ask the question, you know, why is Caleb alone deserving of this honorific and not Joshua? Now, it should be noted, Joshua is called that in the book of Joshua. Joshua, after his death, in the book of Joshua, chapter 24, verse 29, he is described as a servant of Hashem after his death. But Caleb is called that in the Torah. Moreover, besides for Caleb, only Moshe is called a servant of God in his lifetime. Even Abraham was only called a servant of God after his passing. Isn't that interesting? What do we make of this? Now, I don't have an answer, but I do have an angle. I think perhaps an angle to understand what's happening over here is that it makes sense to not apply the description servant of God to someone who is alive. Because if you're alive, well, you have free will. And you may be a servant of God now, but there's a possibility of you losing that status. But somehow, perhaps, it's not a concern with Caleb and with Moshe. And what that is, it's a very interesting question to mull over, to ponder, to think about. Why? that Caleb and Caleb alone have this distinction, Abraham, Moshe, and Caleb. I thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this Parsha podcast that I am recording in the Torch Center in Houston, Texas, in sweltering Houston, Texas. Summer is here, I assure you. Have a fantastic day. Have a splendid rest of your week and an uplifting, inspiring, dynamic An edifying Shabbos. And please, God, with the help of the Almighty, we will gather again next week for another Parsha podcast. And as always, my email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com.